this webinar is immigration and your wealth, what you need to know. Uh, so I'm going to give you a quick overview and then we'll hand over to Yaku. Um, basically, before we start, uh, who is Rand Swiss and what do we do? Uh, you know, we're a diversified financial services provider. We've got a network of many, many product providers. There's a lot of, uh, I suppose, sell-side analysts and, and very clever people that sit behind uh, the faces that you see on the webinar today. Um, we have amazing access into, into I suppose, Investec, into, um, you know, even into, into SARS uh, recently when we were, we were handling one of the issues around on immigration. So um, what we're going to do today is we're really just going to share some of the insights that we have, um, you know, from a product by product basis. Uh, we run a stockbroking firm. That's what we're known for. Uh, online trading and private broking. Online trading is very much a self-directed accounts that we offer clients. Private broking is the more traditional old school stock broking. We offer, also offer managed portfolios. About 85% of our assets now sit internationally. So we are very focused on the international markets. And to assist with, with international market uh, investment, we've, we've also actually registered with the Reserve Bank. That falls under our offshore transfers product. Uh, we can get very, very low cost international transfers, which obviously we can, you know, we're doing it for our international asset management products. But if you are thinking of immigrating, uh, it gives you a very low cost route to, to externalizing wealth. Um, we can obviously help you with pricing, uh, you know, you know, the rate where, where we think the rate will go out. I'm going to chat a little bit about uh, where the rate is now and, 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 and those international investment options for you. I'll, I'll kind of finish the webinar with that. Um, we also deal with structured products, which are kind of a medium risk uh, investment product. Uh, we've got a very nice international one that I'll show you briefly today as well. Uh, we, we did a, a presentation with the provider about a week and a half ago. So if you are interested, uh, I'll just send you links to that video. Uh, that will be closing on the 22nd, but it's a fantastic way to, to, to invest once you're offshore. Uh, we'll chat a little bit about that. And then finally, okay, tax-free savings accounts and wealth management. Um, specifically wealth management, Yaku is obviously a certified financial planner. Um, so if you have, you know, when you're immigrating, obviously there's all these concerns that you're going to have about your retirement money, money that uh, you haven't yet paid tax on. And there's a lot of rules and regulations on how you can and can't uh, touch that money when you're moving to a, a new destination. Uh, Yaku is going to uh, briefly cover that. And of course, we're going to be open for questions. So anything that you would like to chat about. Why should you listen to us? Well, like I said, we know our security is broken, but uh, we've uh, currently ranked the number one stock broker in South Africa. Uh, we won the overall uh, Securities Broker Award in 2021. Uh, we also won the People's Choice Award, which is voted to, for by our clients. Uh, we're very, very client-centric business. We, we, we build really things that, that clients want. And, and what we've seen over the last little bit is this demand for, for international investment options. So we've done a lot of work over the last, say, seven years to, to build that, uh, those products out. It actually comes into the name RAND Swiss, RAND and Swiss. It's the link between the South African markets and the international markets. Uh, we've also won the top tax-free savings account provider two years in a row. These are all uh, rated by the Financial Mail and Intellidex, who does the underlying grunt work for the Financial Mail. Um, so we currently hold our three awards. The awards will come out again in September. Uh, and we hope if you are a client or if you use our services, we do hope that you will go and vote for us. Um, as you can see, we, we're competing against really the big, the big listed banks uh, are kind of our, our contemporaries so that we, we, we fight against. So Standard Bank came in second, PSG also a listed company, F&B Securities, uh, Stockbroking and Portfolio Management, uh, also a uh, listed Easy Equities and GT and Approval Capital, also a listed group. So we, we really are punching a long way above our weight, but we've got very, very good guys on the desk and, and hopefully a, a depth of insight uh, that we can supply to you on a very personal basis that, that they can't. And I think that's where we get uh, that's where we win the awards. Um, so what are we going to cover today? So it was rescheduled for today. If you remember, Yaku unfortunately had COVID the last time we were going to do this. So uh, we'll be happy to see he's hale and hearty and, and back with us. Uh, so I'm just going to touch on, on the, the concept of should you immigrate, should you or shouldn't you immigrate, and a couple of thoughts I have about that. I'll be quite quick because if you watched our last one, I kind of uh, gave you quite a detailed answer on that. I'll then hand over to Yaku. He'll take you through the key, the key concepts of tax immigration. He'll talk about the three-year rule and retirement products, and then uh, proposed amendments to, to financial immigration uh, regulation and how it will affect you. Um, then he'll hand back to me, and I'll just take you through the, the basic mechanics of, of transferring funds internationally, kind of like the tips and tricks. You know, what, what can you do to essentially save you, you money? If you are externalizing and if you are leaving South Africa permanently, there's obviously a lot of capital that, you know, for anyone, whether it's a big or small in our mind, doesn't matter, but it will be the, the majority of your wealth that's going to leave. 
Um, and that means that you know even a one percent uh, improvement in the cost, or, or you know sometimes a three or four percent improvement in the rate that you're going to get, um, is going to have a material impact. I mean, this can run into hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars, even millions in savings, uh, if you do it if you do it the right way, depending on the size of your portfolio. So I'll, I'll share a couple of tips and tricks there, um, and then I'm going to just take you through two two basic invest international investment products because often when you immigrate. Um, it's not something that happens all at once. You know, many people that we speak to, it's taking years. They, they start by getting their wealth out. They start investing in the jurisdiction that they're going to immigrate to. Um, and then, you know, almost the, the last phase of your immigration is when you're, you're thinking about how do I pack my bags and, you know, how do I get the pets across and all of that kind of stuff. Bef long before that, the, the majority of your, your wealth should have moved out of the country. It's not to say we can't help you in the emergency situations where you're like, oh, I haven't done this properly. Uh, but this is that these products are really to to put you in a position where, where when it comes time to to move uh, jurisdiction, uh, you're going to be a lot more relaxed. You know, a lot of the things are already going to be set up for you. Uh, so immigration, should you or shouldn't you immigrate? Uh, for me, there's a couple of different things. So so one, you know, I, I like to think, you know, I say I, the first point I've got is media mindset, which is really try and avoid. Uh, the pessimism and the, the almost emotive immigration decision. We, we recently did, well, we've done two immigration expos now. Uh, many people on this call will have come to the immigration expo um, and maybe didn't get to chat to us and that's why you're coming to listen to us. So one of the things I always say to people is try and not make an emotional decision. It, it, this isn't just an emotional decision. This should be a financial decision that you're making. Um, and it's so easy to make an emotional decision when you look at the, you know, when you look at the civil unrest that we've had uh, last year in, in KwaZulu Natal, when you look at the, the, the you, you know, just the, the pessimism around the corruption in South Africa, um, it's very easy to become disillusioned and then make a bad decision because of that. Um, you know, my, my feeling is look at your personal situation and, and try and look at the things that actually are going to change the quality of life for you. Just the fact that you're irritated with our politicians for me is, is probably the wrong decision to, to start to immigrate. Um, the right, so, so just be, be cognizant of that because so many people that we spoke to at that, that, um, that, that uh, those two immigration events, their, their attitude was kind of like, I'm sick of South Africa, I'm leaving. And you, you said, okay, well, what job are you going to? What, what industry do you work in? Uh, what have you done? Into, what have you put in place so far to you know, protect your finances? You know, what kind of lifestyle are you going to have there? What are the activities that you enjoy? You know, what is your family situation? We started asking all those questions. And it became very apparent that immigration was a terrible idea, but it, it had just become almost a gut reaction to the mainstream news headlines. So if you're, if you're still on the fence and you're thinking, should I immigrate, shouldn't I immigrate? My, my, my best advice I can give you is, is also think, think very carefully because often the grass seems green on the other side, but it's not necessarily the case. It needs to be the right decision for you. The best way, if you want to talk about that in your personal context, is to come and see a wealth manager like Yaku. Come and speak to one of our guys and actually look at your own financial situation. Look at the prospects that you have overseas. Um, and then you can kind of look at, look at your visa situation. So many people are, you, you know, they'll talk about it, and I'm sure Yaku can talk a little bit about the visa as well but they oh we'll just we're going to do this visa or that visa they have no ancestral ties the actual immigration process is almost prohibitively expensive for them to to get a foreign passport or, or to immigrate they maybe don't have the skills so there's a lot that goes into an immigration and, and like i said try and understand all of that before you 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 just re respond to a headline so that's the, the media mindset so for me what are the correct reasons that you should be looking to immigrate so uh, you know, for me, if South African healthcare really starts to deteriorate, if you can't get the medical care in South Africa that you can get somewhere else, that is, for me, is a very legitimate reason to, to immigrate. Uh, at the moment, you know, depending obviously on which country you're going to, this is a very broad topic, but even some of the, the leading uh, public health uh, institutions in Europe, for example, are knowing the private healthcare standards of South Africa. So just be, be cognizant of the type of healthcare you're going to achieve overseas and the type of healthcare you're facing in South Africa. You know, of course, if we see, you know, national health insurance going through and a real collapse in, in the healthcare situation in South Africa, that should prompt, you know, they, then absolutely time to immigrate. I think I might be along with you. For now, that's not, I don't believe that's the case. Crime, now crime is a very personal thing. If you've been affected by crime, um, you, you know, safety, safety is a very unique thing. Um, you know, if, 
you know, from my point of view, I've been very fortunate. I haven't been you know, affected by, by violent crime, um, but many people you know, can mitigate that risk without immigration. So they can, you can live in a gated complex. You can semigrate to a, to a safer area uh, than you're living currently. So there's many ways to mitigate those risks without immigration. At the same time, if, you, if you're, you, you're looking at it where the, the crime, South Africa is an incredibly dangerous country. If you look at the, there was a crime, crime index released uh, recently, um, and I mean, you compare us to somewhere even like Cairo or Egypt, we are significantly more dangerous to live in. We, we, this is a dangerous society to live in. And if that is something that it, you know, keeps you up at night, if that's something that is persistently a worry and is causing psychological uh, concern for you, absolutely, immigration probably is it's a very valid reason to immigrate. And I think that's, that's something that is, is certainly um, important. Should you or shouldn't you? The other thing that comes down to is family. You know, whenever you immigrate, if you're not immigrating to join family members, um, there's a huge degree of isolation when you immigrate to a new place. I mean, I've lived overseas uh, for, for years and, and you break those, those kind of social bonds that you used to have. So from my point of view, uh, if you're joining family, that, that's a positive to immigration. If you're all coalescing in Perth, that's one thing. Um, the problem is these days that many South African families, there's this diaspora, there's just the spreading out of, of, of families. And, you, you know, I look at my family, I've got cousins in France, cousins in, in Australia, I've got a sister who lives in Denmark, and like, you know, like, it's a very, it's a very spread out situation. So, so there's no way I can immigrate to be with family, but, but family is, is always obviously an incredibly important concern. Um, and finally, and, and finally, the last one, um, okay, I've talked about immigration, so I'll just say this is the last one, it's opportunity. Again, it comes down to what is your life going to be like on the other side? Have you got a, like an incredible job offer that you're moving to? Um, if the idea is, oh, I'm just going to go and start a business in a foreign country that I know nothing about, I think be very, very cautious. Understand the opportunity that is presented to you in whichever country you're going to. If you're looking at it and you've got an international company that you're moving with to, to a jurisdiction where you're going to earn a lot more, uh, you need to do kind of your calculations on what is the living cost there? What is the quality of life going to be there? But all of this, as I said, all of these decisions are, are incredibly personal and, and the best way to really go through it with, uh, uh, you know, to, to kind of almost get a sounding board, chat to a financial advisor, sit down with a financial advisor or a life coach. Um, and it, it, there's a huge benefit to kind of thrashing out these ideas and trying to try, trying to have a third party just assist you in making the most objective decision possible. So that's my kind of should you or shouldn't you immigrate, my kind of thoughts around immigration at the moment. Of course, uh, you know, please, if, if I haven't covered anything or if you guys say, ah, oh, Gary, but you've forgotten this or you've forgotten this, please hit us in the chat window or, or in the Q&A section. Uh, I'd love to kind of expand on this, but the, this has always been my thinking around immigration. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand over to Yako. He'll take you through the key uh, concepts of, of tax immigration, and then I'll join you in a little bit for the, um, the segment on the investment options. Great. Thank you, Gary. Much appreciated. I hope you can hear me. If not, just uh, drop us a chat, um, but, but you should be able to hear me clearly. So let's jump into it. Um, from I think we have to start somewhere. Um, in terms of uh, money immigration, in terms of financial immigration. Um, and as Gary men mentioned, we probably not, you know, we can obviously put you onto the right people to assist with your visa. Uh, we can chat around a lot of visa uh, concepts uh, at least, but, you know, that's not our focus. Um, the same with moving, you know, he, he, he said they take cats to dogs and the furniture and the vintage cars and whatever else you have um, uh, to, to physically move it to, to your new country. That's also not quite Rand Swiss. But what we do is we take care of the money aspect of it. Um, and for that, I think we just need to cover a few concepts um, just to understand where we're going from here. So firstly, everybody, I think, on this call probably heard of financial immigration. Now, financial immigration is not an actual uh, term in legislation. Uh, it's kind of what we use colloquially to, uh, to, to explain uh, immigration. But in essence, financial immigration meant, and, and I'll explain now why I'm saying past tense, why I'm saying it meant, um, that you needed to uh, 
from a SARS, South African Revenue Service, and from a SOB, South African Reserve Bank perspective, uh, you needed to immigrate. Um, and those two then put together up to 1 March 2021 20, uh, uh, would have constituted what we call, uh, or what you would have read or seen or heard, um, financial, the, the concept of financial immigration. Uh, that kind of changed um, on the 1st of March. And, and, and the big change there is the physical presence test, which we'll get to um, in, a, in a few seconds. Um, everything got rolled up into a more SARS-driven process. So if um, when we talk these days, we, we rather refer to tax immigration. Um, versus financial immigration. So I think tax immigration will be um, more appropriate to use. Uh, that's the first thing. Secondly, when I talk about a tax resident, um, I'm going to explain it now, but a tax resident means you have to pay, pay uh, tax in uh, South Africa. All right. Um, on the 1st of March 2021, this uh, Taxation Laws Amendment Act came uh, into play, and that necessitated these uh, changes. And it's all about a resident versus a non-resident um, for tax purposes and exchange, as, as I mentioned, SARB for exchange control purposes, but now it's all in one. Um, so, so SARS will handle the process. What does it mean to be a tax resident? So South Africa, a couple of steps, steps back is our uh, tax system is a residency-based tax system. What does that mean? If you are a resident, they will require you to pay tax. If you're not a resident, you know, then you'll only be required to pay tax on your SA-based assets if you have assets in South Africa. Um, how do they understand whether you are a resident in South Africa or not. So the, the easy one is the ordinarily a resident. Uh, so that's the simple one. This is my home. I've gone you know, overseas for you know, a short period of time. My company sent me over for three or six or 12 months on some kind of or type of assignment, uh, but I'm coming back, you know, the kids are here, et cetera. Um, that, you know, that's the easy one to figure out. The physical presence test is a little bit more tricky. Um, and, and I'm not going to delve into it. If you, if you want more information around that, please, you know, send an email, drop us an email or phone and, you know, and we can give you the actual legislation, but it's, you know, it's, it's, it's probably two, three pages uh, explaining, you know, 91 days in any given period and then over five years, 800 days and et cetera, et cetera. So it gets quite tricky and compli uh, complicated to understand the physical presence test. But in essence, once you've passed the test that you or haven't passed the test that you're physically present in South Africa, then you are, or then you can become a tax uh, non-resident. Okay, so tax resident versus a tax non-resident. So a tax resident in South Africa will pay tax on the worldwide assets. Um, so in, in, in theory, at least, if you have a house in England and a, and a bank account or an investment account in Switzerland, et cetera, et cetera, um, and you, but you're a South African tax resident, that means you will be taxed on you know, all of those assets. Um, or most of them, at least, you know, some some may be excluded due to double taxation agreements, etc. But in general, when you're a tax non-resident, you will only be taxed on SA-based assets. For example, you know, a, a one that we see kind of often is when a client immigrates. What stays behind is a living annuity, and we'll get get to that a little bit later. But uh, what are the things that stay behind is a, a living annuity. So that's a SA-based asset you will get taxed on it, but you're gonna earn an income potentially and you know, have a life and, and many other assets that, that's, that, that will produce either a capital gain or income or whatever the case might be uh, across the waters, but SARS won't care about those at all because now you're a tax non-resident. So only SA-based assets 
will be um, you know will be SARS's concern if you're a tax non-resident. The last one on the techni technical concepts I just want to uh, quickly mention is um, CGT. Now, uh, and, I, and I have a slide um, that, that we're going to chat about exit charges or exit tax. Um, it, it popped up in, uh, in the media a little bit as, a, as an exit tax. Um, and, and I'm going to explain you know, where, where they're kind of trying to head with that. It is a little bit on the back burner. But typically, again, colloquially, you would have heard this concept of an exit tax or an exit charge. Now, 95% of the time, that is just CGT. You are, you are selling assets to your international self. So if I have a, you know, a house um, here and I become a, a, a non-resident, um, a non-tax resident uh, at least, that will now be owned by an, my international self. Um, same with the bank account offshore, where, where you would have owned it, now you, 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 you need to own it in your new capacity, in your new uh, destination. And therefore, SARS is basically saying to us, if you immigrate or if you would have sold the, these um, assets whether that's a stockbroking account with with gains on it or it's a it's a physical property that you know has grown over 20 years and you bought it for you know a tenth of what it's worth these days they said at the point where you would have either died or donated it and now in this case immigrated it at some point you would have paid us a tax and that's capital gains tax we just want our slice of the pie because otherwise we miss out. Um, so typically think of it as you, on the day you immigrate, you sell to your international self. Um, so there is a physical transaction on, on, on the assets and whatever that may mean from a tax perspective, that is typically the exit tax or the exit charge up to, up to now. You'll see there's now something lurking uh, but but we'll get to that now. So CGT is um, is is mostly the, the the culprit when we talk about exit tax. Then um, the new one that also came in with the um, with uh, on the first of March twenty twenty one is this three year rule. Um, now it was quite controversial, and I suppose it is still quite controversial. Um, and I think the reason why it's so controversial is, and, and, and that third point of mine I'm going to kind of highlight first, is the fact that a lot of people, and, and Gary alluded to it now as well, a lot of people don't always qualify uh, to, to get a visa based on experience or, you know, their uh, they specific occupation is not a, you know, a, scarce occupation in, in, in the new destination. So they don't really always get that or a work opportunity directly. Um, so, so a fair amount or a large amount of people immigrating, immigrate with investor visa. So you have to put down, you have to either buy a property or buy into a business, etc. There's all the countries are a little bit different. Um, and uh, we need to understand that usually before the three-year rule started in terms of a retirement annuity, this was one of the assets that we could have drawn on. So we do the uh, uh, immigration and then the retirement annuities were available. You know, and if, if you've worked hard for, you know, 20, 30 years and you've, you've diligently contributed to, to a retirement annuity, you know, that can be a, a reasonable amount of money, um, enough to purchase a property potentially or invest into a business uh, offshore or whatever to get these investor visas. So I would say controversial from that perspective that, um, that this can now no longer be used for that immediately at least. Um, you know, we have this three-year rule after um, uh, immigration. But what does it mean uh, practically? So you have to be, remember I explained this concept of tax non-residency, you have to be a tax non-resident for three years. That is the, the, 
the um, law actually says the reporting period. So, you know, it's still a little bit open for interpretation, but it, it's probably, it could be less than three years. If, uh, you know, if you fall, um, if, if your tax reporting fall over three periods and it's only two and a half years, or two years and one month. Uh, but generally we, we just talk about the three year rule. So if you leave the sh our shores now, you immigrate, you cannot touch your retirement annuity, actually not just retirement annuities, it's, it's your, your, your pension assets, uh, but you must remember the, the only real pension asset that is a problem is the retirement annuity. Um, we'll talk about pension funds and preservation funds now. So, uh, but it talks about pension assets. So it is definitely broader in its application than just retirement annuities, but, um, it, uh, it, it, it typically will affect your retirement annuities. All right, so then you'll have to wait for three years and then the money can, um, can, can follow you, the assets you have in your retirement annuity. Um, this is, however, retrospect retrospectively active. So if you're sitting in the UK or in somewhere else um, and you've already been there for two years, um, you know, that th those two years will count. It's not, it, it, it will not start the, a fresh two years from 1 March 2021. Uh, so, so it will be re retrospectively active. So we've said retirement annuities already, that you will, you will have to um, uh, wait for the three years or three reporting periods. The next one then is uh, pension funds. So typically when you resign from your pension fund, uh, when you resign from your employer, your pension fund, you have the option um, or to take it in cash, right? You, you could um, move it into a preservation fund, et cetera. And it's and all those, uh, um, I understand there are more options than what I'm referring to now, but let's just keep it fairly simple. Um, pension funds, you have the opportunity to cash in once you resign from your South African employer. Let's assume you have resigned already from a South African employer. And this is where this retirement asset definition uh, in the Pension Funds Act catches uh, some people in terms of the three-year rule. In this case that I'm going to kind of present now, the three-year rule will be applicable because I'm, I'm assuming somebody had a pension fund, let's say, they moved it in, into a preservation fund. So then it's a pension preservation fund. And what do you have in a pension preservation fund or any preservation fund? Um, as long as the rules allow it, you have one withdrawal typically. Um, and some clients have access that withdrawal. And some, sometimes it's for something small. They just you know, didn't want to buy a you know, a, car, a new car cash, uh, sorry, they didn't want to finance a car, they just want to buy it cash. And then they took a withdrawal from the preservation fund. Not the greatest idea, I understand there may be reasons for that, but um, for some reason they tr triggered the one withdrawal, the allowance of full one withdrawal. And then in those cases, um, you your pre preservation funds will unfortunately uh, fall in the same category because it is listed as a retirement asset. You've used your one withdrawal. Now you have to technically wait until age 55, but now you've immigrated. So you are going to have to wait the three years. Um, you know, that's, that's one of the drawdowns, but that's the three year rule that is now active. Um, and, uh, and, and I hope that kind of uh, explains it. Next one, then I just want to talk, uh, as I said, you know, when I started now, I just want to talk about the proposed amendments to financial immigration regulations. Um, this draft taxation laws amendment bill, um, it was earmarked for 22, for 2022, for this year. Um, it's a little bit on the back burner at the moment, but I don't think it's off the table quite as yet. Um, and, and, and forget everything on, on the slide for a second. And let me give you, a, I think, a good example. What SARS is just trying to get here is again that example I had of their slice of the pie, right? 
they still just want the slice of the pie. So they, um, let, let me give you an example. A client has, let's, let's say, a living annuity. Now, to have a living annuity, you've, let's assume, you've um, saved in a pension or a retirement fund or a retirement annuity or however you save um, in, in, in whatever retirement asset uh, you had, and then you converted it into a living annuity. Now, remember, a living annuity can't move with you. That's the one thing that's never going to move. You can up the, the percentage from 2.5, which is the minimum, to 17.5 per annum, um, you know, and you can still move it out from that perspective. But that's the one that's going to drag and it's going to you know, stay, stay here. There's no three-year rule or immediate rule, anything like that for a living annuity. So assuming that living annuity, had, let's say we started with a retirement annuity over the last 40 years, whatever the case may be, and you've diligently um, paid towards that retirement annuity. Why? What is one of the biggest or probably the biggest um, uh, uh, reason why we use retirement annuities? It's simply the fact that we don't have to pay tax on that, right? It gets taken off the top line in terms of tax. So You've, what you've done is, is, is not that you're never going to pay tax on it, but you've deferred your tax up to the day that you um, retire. So, so then you're going to start, well, the, the, the SARS is thinking, then you're going to start earning an income from that uh, retirement annuity or whatever the retirement asset is that you choose to, to provide this income. And that income will be taxed you know, in normal income tax tables and that's where now they get their pound of flesh so the past 40 years you get this you know uh, deduction on your income tax uh, calculation for every year so so SARS gives you this advantage you have if you know added growth on it etc and it grows over however many years um, and then at the end they feel that now they should you know, start getting some tax back because they gave you all these tax break, breaks over the last 20 years. Now, generally that happens, but if people immigrate um, to, and the last point there is DTAs, double taxation agreements, to a jurisdiction that has a double tax, taxation agreement with South Africa, and not always, but mostly it applies, well, uh, one of the places it applies to is, is, is the UK double taxation agreement. So now I get, you know, however much money monthly from my South African living annuity, and that goes to the UK. There's a double taxation agreement. So I get taxed in the UK and South Africa never see any slice of that pie. So um, this is on the table to change that. So if you have retirement assets locally, that are only taxed offshore due to double taxation agreements, for example, they are thinking of or they're proposing uh, to change that and to have an exit tax. So, so where I earlier referred to the exit tax as um, CGT, capital gains tax, you know, I said, you know, there, there might be one or two nuances coming in uh, further down the line. It's, I don't think it's imminent uh, at the moment. It, it would have been imminent when, when we spoke last year, uh, but it looks like it's a little bit on the back burner. But just understand that, that they want to um, apply this, and this will be, in my opinion at least, a true exit tax. Uh, because, you know, just for simply uh, leaving our shores, there's, a, there's now a taxable event. Uh, not just the CGT that you would have had anyway when you, um, uh, when you sell an asset, etc. Okay, so those are the, uh, the points I just wanted to cover for now. Um, I think the next one is then Gary again, and he will, he will take you through a couple of other slides. Perfect. Um, great, Jacob. That's uh, great. Thank you very much. Uh, if you guys do have questions, please, uh, again, hit us in the chat window or the Q&A section. 
uh, Yakul hang around. I'm going to uh, wrap it up. Uh, but uh, yeah, Yakul's obviously going to be here for the Q&A session afterwards. So if you do have any uh, RA living in UT pension provident uh, type questions around immigration or just those kinds of questions, uh, just hit us in the chat window. So now let's go through the hidden costs of an offshore transfer. So just in terms of you know, preparing yourself before you're immigrating, and we're talking about you know, discretionary money now, money that has, you haven't yet paid tax on. Uh, the current annual transfer limits for individuals are as follows. So 1 million uh, per adult uh, per year. Now uh, that's per calendar year. So from the 1st of January to the 31st of December, uh, you have 1 million that you can take out under what's called the single discretionary allowance. Um, so you, you need no tax clearance for that. Uh, it's literally a one pager you just signed to declare, you, you know, the bank that we use anyway, that uh, you haven't yet taken out more than a million this year, and you can transfer it. No need to deal with SARS, no need to get a foreign tax clearance certificate. Uh, it's, it's, that allowance then resets. Uh, you can re it resets every calendar year. So often we see the biggest uh, flow out, and certainly in, I'd say, the last four years. Uh, we've had very, very strong currencies around that uh, calendar switchover period, so between December and January. Uh, so a lot of people, you know, previously, you know, when the RAND was sitting at about 14, uh, they were just taking, they take their million in December, and then they take another million in January, and then they'd be waiting to see what happens in future because the currency has been quite strong. Um, remember, this uh, is per person, per individual. So a lot of people also use, uh, you know, the spousal limit, the spousal transfer. Uh, kind of exemption, if you want to put it that way. Um, because remember, if you're married, you have an unlimited donation. There is no donations tax uh, between spouses. So you know, often if you have 2 million, but you want to get and you're married, uh, you would just do a transfer of a million to your partner and they would take out a million under their allowance. Totally allowed. There's no tax, tax implication of that because you're married. Uh, you have this unlimited donation ability between spouses. Remember, the limit is 100,000 for, for third parties. So you can't give a million bucks to your kids and take it out under their allowance without essentially triggering uh, donations tax of 20%. Uh, on the, the balance above 100,000. So uh, that's, that's how people use the, the single discretionary allowance. Of course, you have then further to that another 10 million that you can take out. So 11 million total. Uh, that you do by uh, getting a foreign tax clearance certificate. We assist clients with them if you, if you require them. If you have accountants, we generally work with your accountants. It just makes it easier than taking over your e-filing profile. Uh, if you are e-filing yourself, it is really, really simple. We can, uh, you know, our guys will jump on a Teams call or a Zoom or a um, any desk or team viewer, and they can literally show you where to submit the application. We'll get your application packed ready uh, to get that FDCC uh, through. Uh, but basically what you need to do is uh, three, three years assets and liabilities. I've seen people apply literally with assets, three years assets and liabilities written essentially on a post-it note. So it's, you can, it doesn't have to be overly complex, the fact that you submit to SARS. Uh, we give you a nice little template that you can kind of fill in. It gives you, you know, it gives you all, all the things. Oh, I forgot I also have that and that's worth something. So it gives you a nice template that you can just fill in and that gives you your three years assets and liabilities. You also need to be able to um, uh, show the source of funds. So uh, quite often people say, oh, but I've got a house that's worth 5 million. I want to apply for a tax clearance of 5 million. Uh, you need a sale agreement. You need to have some tangible market value to that house. You can't just say, oh, I value it at 5 million. Therefore, I want a tax clearance of 5 million. Uh, that's that's not going to be allowed. So we need to be able to prove the source of funds. You need a sale agreement, or the easiest is we give you know, very very good interest rates in our uh, cash management accounts. Generally, to make the submission as simple as possible, we usually just move the cash in there. Um, we can then prove the source of funds uh, because the funds are sitting in one of the accounts that we have. Um, so, but essentially, just a, a statement with showing the the value of the of the, the assets is enough. Um, you know, that and we write you a letter, we put it all together and we do a little tax pack for you. Uh, it used to be 21 days before those would be approved. Uh, SARS is pretty fast at the moment. Um, you can get them through in about five working days, uh, so long as there's no issues. One of the other issues that we find with people that have accountants, that South African accounting profession maybe is not what it used to be, but quite often we've had foreign tax clearance applications uh, disallowed because the client's taxes are not up to date. So your, your taxes do have to be up to date. And, and quite often the clients don't know about that. They come to us and go, but my taxes are up to date. And we go, oh, actually, you haven't filed for last year yet. So uh, you need to make sure, obviously, your, your tax affairs are in order in order to generate that foreign tax clearance certificate. Another mistake that clients make is they get the tax clearance certificate rather than the foreign tax clearance certificate. They're two different types of certificates. 
Um, so just be aware of that. You know, often people say, oh, but I've already got my, my foreign tax clearance certificate, and then they send us a tax clearance certificate or certificate of good standing. That's not the same thing. Uh, but like I said, not, not difficult to get them. And then you, you have, from the point that that uh, TCS pin, so it's a tax, uh, tax clearance pin is issued, you then have one, one year from that point. So that doesn't run on a calendar year. If you apply in November of 2022, uh, that, that uh, foreign tax clearance certificate will run uh, for one year from November 2022 until November 2023. Uh, if you want to take out more, remember you can still do the spousal thing. So you could take up to 22 million a year out um, if it's you know, obviously all legitimate, but not, not uh, a particularly heavy administrative burden. Uh, that covers the majority of people that are looking to immigrate. But if you have more than that, uh, you can do a special approval, a special reserve bank approval, and there's no limit on that. So the idea that you are limited to only 10 million a year or 11 million per person per year um, is, not, is not true either. You can get special reserve bank approval uh, and you can get it in the hundreds of millions. Uh, it is obviously just a little bit more complex from an administration point of view, but that is uh, possible as well. So banks versus independent currency test. Like I said, I'm going to share some tips and tricks about how to make sure your transfer is as cheap as possible. So the first thing is um, you will find uh, that currency desks are generally a lot cheaper to move than, than banks. Um, it's quite often, you know, people just go and they do their, their uh, currency transaction with their bank because they're used to their bank. And they think, oh, it's really simple. And then they phone the bank and the bank goes, oh, we're not going to charge you any commission on this anyway. Uh, the point is that's not entirely true. What they charge is spread. It's not called a commission because it's not over and above. It's just in the rate that they're showing you. And that spread can be very, very expensive. Currency desks that popped up all over. Obviously, we would prefer you to use our currency desk. Like I said, we've set it up specifically to assist our clients with, you know, when they're working in international jurisdiction. So our rates are very, very competitive because we. This is not a primary product for us. It's it's almost a supplementary product that helps the functioning of our other businesses uh, work even better. Um, so, but I mean, there are there are literally hundreds of these little treasury outfits that that uh, that that can give you sometimes very very aggressive rates. Um, typically, I've got a rate comparison with the banks in a second, but uh, the benefit as well is that the, the fees are usually very transparent. Not now, I can't speak for every, every currency desk uh, in the country, obviously. I mean, many of them generate their own uh, remittance advices, etc. But I mean, we will declare exactly what the cost inside of the spread was, what the markup from interbank rates were to you. Uh, not everyone does it, but most of the independent guys do it. The banks don't do it at all. So you might see, oh, I took out my money and I got 16.20. That seems like a reasonable rate. Uh, but the bank might have gotten you out at 15.50 and tacked on 70 cents worth of spread cost, um, which does add up. It is possible, and, and if they don't, if you can't see the reporting on it, I never just trust it. I just, I just don't trust that kind of thing. I want to see where the where the trades go through mainly because I know what uh, big international bank desks are like when it comes to execution. It's one of the reasons in our portfolios that I like to have our, our, all our execution done in-house rather than farm it out to the, the UBSs or Credit Suisses or whoever it is, because it just gives us that much more control over the actual trade function. I mean, my history is obviously to sit on trading desks, so I know where the nonsense is, and I like to stop, stop guys from doing it, and obviously we pass all of those savings on to you. Um, and like I said, we are, we are very competitive on cost. Um, so what is the spread? Um, okay, so in a nutshell, a currency desk will charge a slightly higher price, price uh, on the bid and offer than they're willing to buy back. Uh, so you, you bid it, remember, a spread is basically the difference between the bid and offer. Uh, you can think of it like this. Let's say there was a super wide spread on, on Rand dollar. Uh, you know, maybe you could buy uh, Rands at, uh, at 16 Rand to the dollar. You could sell Rands at 15 Rand to the dollar. The difference between where you can buy and where you can sell, that's what the spread is. Now, what does that mean? That means if I'm buying dollars at 16 Rand, I have to fork out 16 Rand uh, I have to bring 16 rands worth and I'll get $1 in exchange. Um, but then if I take that dollar and I give it back and say, hey, can I have my rand back? They're only going to give you 15 rand back. So that difference is a fee. Uh, so that, is, that difference is, is what, now there is a very, very small um, natural liquidity, in the, in the natural spread in the market where people are matching from bids and offers, but it is super, super tight. If you trade on a derivative platforms, you'll know that the spread, I mean, the euro dollar spread, for example, actually goes negative at some stages because in the interbank market, um, you, you know, you might actually have a bank not being able to arb for one or two pips. 
Sorry, this is getting quite technical, but, but it, it's, it's basically the, the, the midpoint. So what we call spot, which is the midpoint between the two. Um, basically, you, you know, there's, there's actually a negative spread sometimes. So it's super, super tight. So any difference between your buy rate and your sell rate is in fact a cost to you. That someone is taking a commission there, whether it's the bank, whether it's the, the agent. And I always love it when, if you travel and you'll know and you see these, I've always got, I always take photos of them because I would like to share them in presentations. Like, well, I actually didn't put one in this presentation, but you'll go to the, like the Bureau de Change and you'll see this big sign above it saying, no commission to change your money. And then you go and look at where the rate is. And it is, it's like a, you can drive a bus through the, the middle of the spread. It's just so wide. And you know, if you do like four, if you buy, you know, you bought dollars and then you sold you, you know you bought dollars sold bought sold three or four times you'd suddenly have no money and you're like hey wait a minute where are the costs in this the costs are in the spread so that's where they hide a lot of the the, the, the pricing um we did a bank uh, so krista did this first krista sits on our treasury desk um he did a comparison between the published bank rates he did a mystery shopping exercise of the banks uh, trying to see where they would do a usd czar conversion uh, based on actual spread. So not based on the, the, the fee that they're going to charge you. Not the, oh, we charge you a thousand rand for the fee plus the 450 for SWIFT. Not that thing that is transparently reported, but you know where the spot market was trading versus what the client rates got. Um, our worst rates, the worst rate that we give clients is 1.15%. Um, the, the rates that we were quoted at the big banks, you can see like on, on the euro dollar uh, sp split, at least the euro dollar pair uh, was 1.87%, 2%, 2.56% at Bank D and 2.15% at, at Bank D. You know who these banks are. They're a lot more expensive. Um, they have brought their, you know, through technology, they have brought their specifically the euro do dollar, um, uh, the euro dollar rate down. Uh, if you're going to Australia or if you're going to Europe, um, so, so euro dollar has become a, a more competitive rate, certainly in the market in terms of what guys are charging in the spread. Uh, but let me tell you, Aussie dollar, New Zealand dollar, the spreads are massive. We've seen up to three and a half, even 4% spreads on New Zealand dollar. Where they, and I mean, work that out. I mean, you, you 4%, uh, you know, you know, 4% 4 on, um, on, on 10 million, you're talking 400,000 rand in fees. I mean, that's what you're going to pay for this, where, where we can cut it dramatically down for you. On 10 million, we wouldn't even charge you 1%. So you'd be, you, you're would be you talking about literally hundreds of thousands in savings uh, by doing by doing the, the, the transaction through either a treasury agent. But like I said, if we're, if we're doing work for you, and certainly if you're working in our international, um, in, in, our inter, in one of our international investment products, obviously we cut these rates even, down even further for you. Um, with the uh, yeah so so then okay so Chris has just done a worked example on on the on um, on a million rand for you and there's definitely a saving so what I want to kind of point out here as well is that there is a an additional fixed fee um, so you can see obviously you know like the, he's just given you a comparison between uh, rand Swiss if we were charging fourteen and sixty three I wish we were at fourteen and sixty three off the last two days. But uh, 14 around 63, the bank would be showing you about 14 around 83. That's the difference that you'll get in dollars. You literally will get more dollars for your deposit on a million rand deposit. You will get $68,352.70 with us. We will only get $67,430. And that's again at our worst rate. And obviously the, when I say our worst spread rate, but obviously the currency rate is also important. Um, the other fee that you need to be aware of is the SWIFT fee. So that's the International Bank of Settlement fee. Uh, that's four, 450 Rand uh, per leg. So that's why we normally say to clients, try and keep your transactions uh, above 100,000 Rand. Uh, as Yaku was mentioning, you know, if you're in a living annuity, we have a lot of clients that uh, you know, have immigrated. They're taking their living annuity payments out each month. Uh, if you've got a small living annuity payment that you're, you're drawing down on, uh, we normally say try and, you know, unless there's, a, you know, like a, a, a reason you know, like I have to live, I have to pay rent. Um, if you can club two or three months together just to get it up, you'll save yourself 450 rand. And we're always trying to basically get your, your cost to as, as efficient as possible. So, you know, that 450 rand you have to pay on every transaction, that's an internationally uh, international fee. No one gets away from it, whether you transferring from one European country to another, all European banks, uh, generally that fee works out about 450 rand. Uh, you, you know, it depends, it depends on the jurisdiction. Some people charge a $28 fixed fee. Uh, 
Um, most of it is there. Now, some of the banks make a markup there as well. Uh, the bank C that we, we did a mystery shopping exercise actually was charging 900 Rand for, for their SWIFT fee, but it should be sitting at around 450 Rand uh, as, as that transactional fee. Um, you know, obviously, if you're doing asset swaps or you're doing something else, there are ways around it, but not if you're actually doing a physical, proper uh, externalization of capital. Um, yeah, you know, how do you make uh, offshore payments with us? Uh, you know, super, super simple. Uh, we work with Investec primarily as our, as our interbank dealer. Um, what happens is we actually create an Investec account in your name, because remember, we have to do the clearances. It all has to come from, from, from you. Uh, we can't take it into a, like a, a central RAND source account and take it out. It's got to be an account in your name. We open a bank account in your name. We, we open it. So our administration team opens that bank account. Uh, we, you know, all the guys here are like various levels of bankers registered at Investec. Um, we create the account in-house. You do just a normal EFT, so electronic funds transfer into the account. Um, once you, you know, basically, okay, once you complete, uh, you complete a transfer form, so we have an FX transfer form wherever you want to send your money in the world, um, we can assist you with international bank accounts, we work with a Swiss bank specifically, which will give you IDAN numbers, etc. But obviously, if you're immigrating and you're going to Australia, or you're going to the UK, uh, you might want, to, you know, a, a retail banking operation in that country. Uh, we've got guys in Greece, we've got guys working in so many different countries that we transfer to. There are some limits just around sanction lists, you know, like if you're in Yemen, we're going to have maybe a couple of problems. Obviously, if you're planning on immigrating to North Korea, we're probably not going to help you on your currency transfer. But, you know, Israel, all over the place, we can do shekels, we've done shekels, we've transferred them to Israeli bank accounts, very, very simple. Um, that, um, yeah, so you complete your transfer form, you tell us where we're sending it. If we're doing it for you, obviously, we've already got your transactional details, then it's not as important. Um, once you receive the transfer form, we'll convert your funds. Now, there's different ways that we can convert the funds. Uh, because we have a trading desk, uh, you can give us a rate. You can say, guys, when, you know, the RAND's just blown out now, and we're going to look at the currency in a second. When the currency blows out, hey, wait a minute, when it goes back to 1540, 1540, 1550, we want you to trade. We can leave an order persistent in the market for you. You can leave it up to our discretion. We'll always, you can say, listen, guys, I want to get out of the next three weeks. I, I'll take it, you know, you guys use your discretion and get it out at the best rate we can. We will try and time the currency for you. Uh, not always successfully. Currency is notoriously difficult to time, but we will do our best. We've got levels that we publish on a regular basis. I'll take them, I'll take you through them in the next couple of slides. Um, or you can just literally get a quote from us and transfer. So if you don't believe me on the banks, um, you can literally phone, phone your bank and say, hey, I want to take up money now. What rate will you give me? And they'll say, oh, we'll give you uh, 1620 and you phone us and we'll give you a rate and say, oh, we'll take it at 1610 or 1605, whatever it is, and you can work out the conversion and we do it for you. Um, the funds move. Two days later, the funds arrive in your bank account. We can do like emergency transfers, so we can do quick settlement for you as well. So, you know, we've we literally we had a guy closing a structured product a couple of weeks ago, and he literally he needed the, the product was closing on the Monday, and he kind of got hold of us on Friday and was like, "I need the money in my account." And we were the kind of like, guys, banks don't work over the weekend. We did an instant, basically settlement for him. We managed to move the, move the money. The money was essentially in his account on Friday afternoon. So there's there's things we can do in emergencies for you that are also quite Cool. So is now a good time to move your money? Um, okay, so <laughs> unfortunately, I did get, we do this once a month for clients in the global outlook that I present. So I presented this uh, last Wednesday. And look at the drama that we've had since then. So we kind of said, and we always kind of, I always give a very accurate, well, not accurate, but I give my genuine opinion on where I think the currency is at any one stage. We were trading at 1532. Um, you know, previously the month before we were at 1610. Um, the, then we, we look at all the median estimates of the, uh, and all the estimates of the big banking houses. So we take a, quite a fundamental view of it. Uh, this is a poll that is published once a month uh, and they ping all the big uh, banks so that they get a sense of where their desks are sitting. Um, the most optimistic bank uh, is Standard Chartered. Goldman Sachs is coming at about 1450 on a 12 month view. The most negative is uh, Wells Fargo and Danske Bank. Uh, you know, if you look at our banks, so Investec, Ned Bank, RMB, they were sitting at kind of, uh, you know, between, you know, like mid, mid 15s as their target. 
our view was we also obviously look at the technicals and draw all these little lines and try and build up some 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 levels for you. Uh, my call on this was uh, get your money out between 15 and 15.35. The month before we had been at like above 16 and I said, wait, I think you're gonna get, uh, get a better level. Uh, 15 to 15.35 was the call. A day later, it got to 15.16. We actually, fortunately, a lot of people on that webinar, we did a lot of treasury flow on the Thursday. And of course, we have since had an absolute blowout in the dollar. So we've had uh, a move. Uh, if you follow me on Twitter, you'll see I've just been posting uh, the Rand dollar exchange rate. The guy actually got hold of me yesterday and said, Gary, have you taken to post? It was about four o'clock. He's like, have you have you taken to posting the time? And then he's like, oh no, you haven't. <laughs> you know? And it's just our currency was just weakening. It was like, you know, it was like 1580, 1590, 16, 1610. We, we peaked at about 16, 1618, which is where we are now. We're almost a rand weaker from, from where those guys got out. So where do I see the currency at the moment? These estimates will obviously get new polls. Part of this is because uh, we, had, we had a very, very, very bad inflation number out of the US on last Friday. Um, we've got the FOMC, so interest rates are probably going to go up in, in the US, uh, or they will definitely go up in the US, but maybe between 50 and 75 basis points, that's the big debate. The Fed did say they weren't going to raise by 75 basis points on Wednesday. Now it's a real possibility. All of this is feeding into currency expectations. My view is at kind of six, above 16, we should take the foot off. Here you start prepping your trade. I wouldn't be pulling the trigger at this stage. Uh, but these are kind of the, I just want to give you kind of an idea of uh, our inputs on how we think about where the currency is trading at any any one point. Um, even though these banks have a huge spread of, of predictions on, the, on the, the currency, they usually give you a good range to work within. Uh, you can see at about 17, that is the most pessimistic forecast on Rand dollars. So if you're buying dollars at this stage, if you're at 60, I mean, if we're at 1620, 1630, you're definitely on the upper side of that range. And, and I would just say, give it a little bit of space. You know, we've still got very rampant commodity prices, which are good for, um, which are good for uh, countries like the RAND. It's just we're facing a lot of risk off and with risk assets selling at the moment, we've seen this big exit. So great for the guys that have already gotten out. For now, uh, we're probably going to have our interest rates go up. And like I said, the interest rates that you're getting on our deposit accounts are actually very, very good. They're a lot better than they, they have been in the past because the interest rates are going up. So to sit on RAND cash for a little bit um, is maybe not a bad idea as we wait for the, the, you know, the kind of panic that we've had over the last two or three days to subside. But these are all things that we'll talk about when we're trying to get you the best rate. Now, the guys that we got out on Thursday, I mean, we might be haggling over one or two percent costs, we literally saved them almost a six, seven percent movement in the underlying currency now uh, because of because of the, the, the accuracy. Like I said, no one knows for sure, but it's nice to have someone that's uh, got their finger on the pulse, uh, just watching these things for you when you are coming to make your final immigration exit. Um, so what is this? I've just also put a chart of the dollar index up. I'm just going to run through these really quickly. You can see the dollar has been the place to be in, in the currency markets recently. Um, I've also got pound dollar. Okay, so pound rand, uh, Frank Rand and, uh, and Euro Rand. All of these have weakened uh, in the last two days. These are all slides from last week, uh, Thursday. So that kind of call at the moment, I still think that that is probably the range. I would say probably 1550 is, is the rate you'd be looking to get out at over the next month. Uh, we might have, you know, but we might get a lot weaker from here. So it's kind of all bets are off until we, we see what the Fed has to say uh, tomorrow evening. Obviously, we've got a public holiday the day afterwards, but uh, we'll be giving you guys an update on the, on the, uh, on the webinars to come. And of course, if you're part of the Rand Swiss community. This is stuff that you've always had access to. Uh, how do you interna internationalize your wealth and hedge against uh, uncertainty? So, of course, now we, we're talking about immigration. What happens, you, you know, like you say, maybe you've got a bank account overseas, but maybe you're only planning on immigrating in three years' time or a few years' time. And what your real concern is, and remember, I talked about those concerns at the beginning, maybe your concern isn't so much the healthcare situation in South Africa. Maybe it's not so much the crime rate, but your real concern is that the value of your investments is going to be severely impacted because of the shenanigans in, in our politics. Or or that you just have a concern that South Africa is not going to grow in the same way as South Africa, and in the same way as the rest of the world. Remember, South Africa is only about half a percent of global GDP, so you maybe feel limited investing only in South Africa. That's where we can step in and solve those problems without you necessarily even needing to immigrate. 
Um, you can live an amazing life in South Africa when all your assets are sitting overseas and linked to, to international markets if, so, if the South African Rand collapses. If the majority of your wealth is dollar-based and the South African Rand collapses, you live a massively good quality of life in South Africa. I remember uh, taking advantage of a, just such a collapse uh, in Argentina when I was a student and moving, I went, went across there for many months and lived on a on a, on a what even in South Africa was a pittance. <laughs> but uh, how do we internationalize the portfolio? Right now, the markets are very, very nervous. So if you are looking at getting involved in equity markets, like I say, uh, or looking for investment options, um, if you follow the Warren Buffett philosophy, uh, you, know, you should buy when others are fearful and be you should be greedy when others are fearful and fearful when others are greedy. I can tell you this is the CNN Fear and Greed Index. Uh, you can Google it. Uh, it's a composite index of a whole lot of different things like the volatility index, the put call ratio, et cetera. If you're into the technical side of things, uh, you're welcome to go look all of that up. Uh, but basically, markets are very, very afraid at the moment by, by a lot of different measures. Uh, this is the volatility index. This is the, what happened to the volatility index, often called the fear and greed index. Um, during the COVID pandemic, it spiked. Uh, right now, we're, we're at fairly elevated levels compared to, we're at about 33 and a half at the moment, but I think we're even higher than that today. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, a long way above where we are. What does that mean? S&P 500 has come down a lot. Uh, it is an interesting time. You know, you can get stocks for a lot cheaper than, than you could have in the past. At the same time, there are reasons why um, people are selling. I mean, people are very concerned about what's happening in China, what's happening, uh, you know, in the Ukraine, and what's happening to inflation and commodity prices in the developed world. That said, what do we do? This is what I invest if I've got an equity allocation. This is what I put my money into. Uh, we built it as the flagship portfolio in Rand Swiss. It really was responding to clients, to, uh, like clients that were demanding almost like a nest egg portfolio internationally. Um, the minimum, you know, we do it on direct stock broking accounts. As I said, remember, we're an award-winning securities broker. That's why we do it this way. I can get your costs much, much lower than, you know, unitized funds. The limit is that there's a, a $50,000 minimum on this product just because I need to buy a whole lot of securities for you. But this is our global managed portfolio. And what happens is it is obviously a high-risk portfolio because it's 100% equity. There's no gearing. It's not a trading portfolio. The investment philosophy is really to go and buy high-quality uh, companies internationally. Um, you know, there's not a growth or a value-based portfolio. There's a blend inside that. We've got some of the growth companies up there, the likes of Google, Amazon, uh, and Nike, which are consumer discretionary kind of tech companies, which have, have been under a little bit of pressure recently. But then we've got things like Pfizer, and IBM, and uh, Lockheed Martin, and Procter & Gamble, a lot of value-based companies that have performed a lot, uh, a lot better. Uh, but the, the philosophy behind this is really to just go and buy the best quality companies in, in, in South Africa, or at least uh, internationally, multinationals that have no chance, or when I say no chance, but very little chance of, of going bankrupt. Uh, the kind of companies that are going to weather any storm. Now, the, the companies that have been around for, you know, a company like Disney has been around for over 100 years. Um, and we expect it to be around for a long time to go with what's going on with uh, Disney+. Plus. It's finally come to South Africa, but we've been backing it for a while. Um, and the idea is long-term investment and generally, you know, sit, sit put, uh, or at least let, let it grow. Don't tamper with it too much uh, and just try and capture real growth in the underlying securities. That's kind of our monthly performance over time. Um, just gonna wrap up quite quickly now. Um, we, we benchmark against the MSCI world. That's just a relative outperformance to the MSCI world. Uh, as you can say, we, we, we've consistently outperformed the MSCI world over, over longer than the last five years. Um, so just to, to have, a, have a look at like the kind of businesses that are in here, uh, we've even got things like General Motors, um, Procter & Gamble, Salesforce, Nike, Amgen, JP Morgan, we've got some banking exposure. It's just a well-diversified portfolio overseas. And you can kind of see the returns that have done. We are obviously getting hit in line with the rest of the markets at the moment, not as bad as the, the rest of the market this year. I mean, NASDAQ is down almost 30%, so we're down about 15% for the year. But uh, if you have a look at the underlying returns here, I mean, you know, 21% in 2017, okay, we had a negative year in 2018. Uh, that was 2018, it was over there. So there was a little dip off into the end of the year. So it's maybe also like the, the point at which uh, the cutoff for the year was that made that 
look a little bit worse than it was. Uh, on that, at the end of that year, the, the MSCI world was down about eight and a half percent. So we outperformed on the downside, which is what we were trying to do. I mean, it doesn't help from a relative point of view. But then obviously a strong bounce back the year before because we're coming off such a low base. So it was 30% return in dollars after cost the year afterwards. 18% in 2022, at least in 2020. That's the pandemic year, just remember. Um, 20% in 2021. And like I said, we're down at the moment because we're in the midst of a sell-off as I showed you on the fixed chart earlier. Uh, but yeah, for me, this is just a fantastic time to invest because uh, hopefully if we, we get by the end of the year, many people are calling it flat. But even if we have a couple of difficult years, this is a product that is designed as a long-term product that you're going to capture the growth of really solid international securities. Um, Medium risk idea. Okay, so this is a Channel Islands product. I said I'll chat to you quickly about structured products as well. So this is an idea that we're closing on the 22nd of July. It is really, really cool. We've had a very good take up of clients. We're putting uh, our own cash into this one as well. Um, and it, it, I think it's, it's, it's had such a good response because you know, no one likes equity markets when they're down. They love it because equity markets in general way outperform uh, any, any other asset class over the, a long period of time. But when you're starting to get concerned that the, the world won't grow like it should over the next five years, this is a product that will do very, very well. So what does it offer? This is a five-year uh, investment. Uh, it's created by Investec. The, what happens is it's a fully internationalized product. So there's no ties to South Africa. If you've immigrated, you can have this product. Uh, what they do essentially is they create a company in Guernsey uh, you become a shareholder of that company, and that company then holds a variety of bonds and other instruments inside it to create the defined payoff profile. Um, this year's iteration, we invested in this for clients and for family in, in 2017. Um, what's happened there, there was a basically a 63% uh, uh, upside cap on, on the product, because uh, the product is capped on the upside, but it gives 100% capital protection. Um, the kind of result was that in RAND terms, we're up over 100% in the, even after the sell-off uh, over the last five years uh, in RAND terms. Uh, like I said, we're going to cap the product at just about maximum, and then we roll into the next product. Um, this product is now available, so it's essentially a company overseas. You can be a shareholder of that company. Uh, it provides 100% downside protection. So what you're getting is a link to the S&P 500 at 45%, 20% in the Euro stocks, 20% in Nikkei, and 15% in global emerging markets. So it's pretty much the MSCI world. Um, but the difference is that if the MSCI world finishes the five-year term down 50%, you get all your money back. If it finishes down 80%, you get all your money back. So it's it's got this big layer of downside protection. Um, which kind of means that you can almost consider, go like uh, compare it to what you would get on cash. And at the moment over a five-year period, if you bought a five-year bond uh, and held to exp expiration, you, you know, I don't know, like your, your, your yield is still going to be pretty low. Um, but yeah, 100% capital protection. And then obviously um, you get this uh, big upside uh, kicker as well. So you get 120% participation in that basket of, of uh of securities, if you want to put it that way, uh, those bar, that basket of indices. So if that index ends up 10%, you're going to get 12% dollar-based return. If the, the, the it ends up uh, 20, 20%, you, you're going to get 24% return. Now they cap it at 40%, so 40% is the upside, so your maximum return is going to be 48%. The product strikes in a couple of weeks, we've already pinged them, so quite often they give you a kicker. Um, already they're talking about moving the, the gearing up to 1.4 1, 1 times uh, in the next couple of weeks. Um, so, you know, we, we're not sure exactly where the, the, the price is, but it won't be less than, than 120%, so 48% in dollars. That gives you roughly the same kind of return as a market, but it's not going to give you super normal returns, obviously. But then for that, you get 100% downside protection. So this is just what the investment payoff profile looks like. Basically, if the index ends down 70%, you get 100% you get of your capital back. If it ends 99% down, you get all your capital back. Um, but obviously, if, it's, if it ends up, you kind of just perform in line with the market. Remember, the dividends are stripped out of the index. Uh, but obviously, if you're expecting very strong markets over the next five years, so if you think that the market's going to end up 100% over the next five years, the maximum return currently that you're going to get is about 48%. Like I said, it probably will be better when we strike on the 22nd, but 48% is kind of what's being marketed. Uh, if you think the markets are that basket of indices is going to be up 
100% over the next uh, five years, better to invest directly in indices or into a portfolio like our global managed portfolio, uh, where you think markets are going to be very, very strong. So it's kind of a medium risk idea. Uh, just remember one of the downsides is this is linked to Standard Bank and, and, uh, and investor credit risk. So you need to be happy that these banks uh, are going to be secure as well, because they are the ones guaranteeing your return. So that's one of the nuances. But like I said, I'll share a link with everyone that was on this uh, web, uh, this webinar to the, 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 the product provider's presentation. Very, very good one, a guy called uh, Yarpi Lubba. Um, you know, he presented it. Uh, he, he very, he, I think I've, I've made it a little bit more complicated than maybe it needs to be, but he, he will take you through that product in, uh, in a lot of detail. The only thing that I will mention is that there is some sort of uh, urgency in terms of time because the product closes on the 22nd of uh, July. So if we don't have applications in uh, June, at least 22nd of June, sorry, I've been saying July, 22nd of June. Um, so if we don't if we don't have those applications in before then, uh, unfortunately you're going to miss it. That product will close, and and we can't say that it's going to be available again because uh, they not investing normally does two offshore products like this a year. Beauty of this product is that it's in Guernsey. It's a company, and you get all the tax benefits of those those bonds and and other instruments underneath that. All their returns are tax free, and the only returns that uh, you're going to be taxed on is essentially if you're a South African tax resident, uh, your capital gains on the share that you own, not all the stuff that would normally be deemed as income tax if you were holding it in the South African jurisdiction. Obviously, if you've immigrated to Dubai or you've immigrated to somewhere with a more favorable tax regime, uh, it's just a, a massively beneficial product to you. Um, to open an account, really simple, go to ransource.com forward slash account. Uh, we need, uh, obviously, your FICA documents on anything that we do, um, and, uh, and then one of our representatives will contact you. So thank you very much for joining us. Uh, this was the rescheduled presentation. Um, but yeah, I think Yaku is here. So I see we've got a lot of questions. <laughs> so a lot of questions, but uh, we'll try and answer them as best we can. Um, Yaku. I see you've been looking at these all up in a way. So yeah, I'm going to do one or two. No, why don't um, you take so it? Can I start off then? Sure. Um, uh, firstly, maybe just uh, Chris, uh, thank you for your email. You sent an email with some questions. Uh, I was out of the office and I read it as I came in a couple of minutes before the presentation. Uh, and, and I had all three answers for you until you said at the end, I'm a I'm a permanent resident, not a citizen. So um, I'm going to take that one offline and I'm going to commit to come, uh, come back to you with an with a, uh, appropriate answer um, on, on your, your email. All right, Adrian, if and when an exit tax and living annuities comes in, if one elects to continue paying your tax in South Africa on this vehicle, notwithstanding you are living permanently in a DTA country, I would presume then any exit tax would not be applicable. No, well, if you pay, you know, surely if you're paying tax in South Africa, that, that would be right, because you, you wouldn't then... Um, then it won't be externalized, 100%. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I would agree with that. Um, just maybe a side note, remember this is still a draft uh, legislation um, and there may still be changes to it. So. Um, don't take uh, our word now as law because um, it, there may still be changes. But in essence, I agree with the yeah. statement. Yeah, but that's it. And I suppose if you, if you, yeah, you know, like, and just, just in terms of the mechanics of the living annuity, like, you know, if you, if you are going to have like your monthly drawdown coming through and you, you know, you permanently need to move those funds internationally. Uh, I mean, just chat to us as well, because I mean, not from a tax point of view, I mean, Yaku, you know, like, like he says, when the, New legislation comes and things might change from a tax point of view, but just from a from a practicality point of view, uh, you can set up a recurring payment, uh, you know, inside our system so that you just know I've got a, you know, especially if you're living in your have been moved to around Swiss and, and you've got one of our advisors working on them, it becomes like from a practical point of view, it becomes very simple because you have one point of contact where you say, you know. I've got a whatever eight percent drawdown or whatever it is. And make sure it hits this bank account every month, um, and then we'll we'll look at it. We're not going to look at that as a you know most other people look at look at it as 
oh, you've got these multiple single small transactions. We lump all of those transactions together. We say, okay, well, we know you're living in the with us. We know that we're going to be paying you out for the next six, seven, eight years. Um, you'll just see that entire uh, external transfer as a single transfer. You can't get away from that 450 rand SWIFT fee, uh, but we can at least give you a discounted rate on the currency transfer as well. So we can make it quite, hopefully, finite, like uh, attractive from the fee point of view on taking that out, even if, if yeah, like I said, but I mean, the tax, the tax concerns, yeah, like I said, it's the still draft uh, legislation. Okay, from, from yeah. Aqua, uh, yeah. Okay, sorry, from Aqua, I'd like more information about the Mauritian, Mauritius retirement residency, where you need, I suppose that's a the visa you're talking about, where you need a thousand five hundred US dollars, pros and cons. Difficult one to answer, um, Akbar. I think uh, let's rather take it offline. You know, I'm, I'm not, you know, and, and, and also where is it only financial pros and cons, I suppose you're asking me about. But, but yeah, uh, definitely want to, to, to look at and to chat about. Lately, I have a client currently scouting for a, for a property in Greece and I'm getting pretty pictures every now and again on WhatsApp from him. Um, so I can tell you a little bit more off the top of my head about, about Greece and Montenegro and, and uh, you know, the US maybe. But uh, yeah, let, uh, let's take it offline and I'll, I'll get back to you in terms of the Mauritian. Yeah, I, I, th I think also just, just in terms of uh, working within Mauritians rather than retirement residency. Um, so we, we work with a number of the Mauritian fiduciary companies as well. So um, we've already got some very, very qualified, you know, if you're setting up, uh, you know, Mauritian trusts or you kind of looking at Mauritian re residency, we have, we have uh, specialist um, companies that are linked to us that we, we can also refer you to if, if we can't answer your question locally. Uh, because just remember, there are just so many different jurisdictions that we, we, uh, we're, we're operating in with so many different people. Uh, you know, we can kind of act as the, the GP in, in a medical sense, uh, but often, you know, like if, if you've got a specific jurisdiction that you're going to, then, uh, then we bring in the expert for that specific jurisdiction. But uh, Mauritius, I mean, we work with a lot of different fiduciary companies in Mauritius because South Africa is find it as quite an advantageous uh, location. Um, so yeah, definitely we've got a lot of support around that. Uh, but yeah, let's take that question offline. I think that's right. Uh, okay, okay, Chris Don, uh, can you continue? Yeah, I'll answer Chris. Uh, okay, you've answered Chris. Yeah. You can take that. Okay, okay. Uh, what forms of funds does the offshore allowance refer to? Is it liquid cash, proceeds from the sale of a property, uh, vehicles, cash in an investment? I'm assuming this does not refer to money from retirement and use pension product, pension preservation funds. Yaku? Yeah, so uh, remember, they, they just need a proof of funds. Mm -hmm. um, so in essence, uh, you know, Gary used the example of a house. Um, I mean, the house has value, mm -hmm. you know, but they want, it, it, it's easier to convince them if there's a physical, you know, sale agreement, et cetera. So it, it needs to be proof of funds. It doesn't have to be liquid. You know, we've, we've, we've given... You know, other assets, uh, many of it, but but it's it's better defined in terms of its value. Um, and yes, I agree. Annuities, provident, and pension funds will not be because you can't transfer them immediately. Yeah. That will not be part of the allowance. Yeah, so it's a very just just to understand that as well. So a lot of uh, you know, especially with the crypto ARBs that have been going on recently. So where there was a different price for Bitcoin in South Africa versus international markets. Uh, there was the Bitcoin arbitrage where people were essentially coming to treasury desks and they were transferring their funds overseas. Um, they were buying Bitcoin, selling Bitcoin locally and just looping the funds round and round and round and round. And what they were trying to do is get these almost big tax clearances, but there was no intention to actually use. The, so, so they were declaring a source of funds as Oh, this is my property. It's worth five million. Give me a five million rand tax allowance. They were then getting, they were then borrowing money from friends and family, or they had a pool of capital that they were looping round and round and round uh, to 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 capture that crypto off. And that's really what the Reserve Bank is trying to avoid, or, or at least SARS is trying to avoid as well. Like what they're saying is they want to, they want to whatever you're you're 
applying for um, to move, uh, they want to be pretty certain that those are the funds that are going to move. And that's why uh, a property without, without a sale agreement, you're saying, but I've got a 5 million rand property, give me the funds. They, then you're going to borrow the funds from someone else and take out funds and then not actually sell the property. That's what they're concerned about because there is regulation around not being able to uh, use your allowance. Uh, you, you can't borrow to use your allowance if you want to put it that way. These funds have to be your funds. So that's really the intention and the spirit of the law. Um, so, so yeah, like like Yaku says, like the the, the retirement unit, for example, because you can't move that, uh, that wouldn't you, you wouldn't be able to use that as a proof of source of funds. But absolutely, vehicles. If you're saying I've got a vehicle and I'm going to sell it, and I'm in the process of immigration, and it does often come down to the the letter that we write and the and, and, and what you're trying to prove. If you're saying I'm busy immigrating, I'm going to go to we buy cars, and they've given me this price for it. I haven't sold it yet, but this is the price. They're going to put it through. Like I said, literally, I've seen clients do assets and liabilities on a post note, post it note, and and get it through. Um, so also finds it a little bit more more difficult, but it, it also does come down to the argument. We try and just get the application through first time. Okay. All right. Um, on immigrating, and once the three-year term has reached, financially immigrating, my RA's pension or provident preservation, would there be a different tax rate applied? for immigrating financially or is financially immigrating considered similar to withdrawing from the RAs? Yes, uh, pension or provident fund. If so, would the withdrawal tax table be applied? Correct. So maybe just a little bit of background. There's two types of, of, of tax levied on monies from, from retirement assets. After you retire or from the retirement date onwards, when you retire, you pay retirement uh, according to the retirement tax table. Um, lump sum tax table and if you anything like a, a preservation fund or in this case you know RAs that you're going to move early out earlier because you are uh, immigrating or anything pre pre the age of 55 um, has the withdrawal tax table um, applicable much more you know onerous you know SARS takes quite a big chunk of it um, so, so you have to be certain you understand it, but the, the answer is yes. Uh, immigration will, uh, once you immigrate, they will use the withdrawal tax table and you can Google it. It's, it's on the SARS uh, website and you, it, will, it will pop up immediately. Okay, so I, I am a pensioner and I have a living annuity. Can I choose which country I will be taxed? Uh, when I immigrate, uh, where there is a double taxation regulation. So uh, as far as my understanding is, you know, South Africa is a residency-based tax system, but so are most, most countries are, have a residency-based tax system. Mm -hmm. So you can't choose where, you know, like I, I, I want to say you can't, because there might be some island somewhere that will allow you to, mm -hmm. but uh, generally wherever you're living, that's where the double taxation agreements uh, will be applied. So if you've immigrated to Australia, you can't say, well, I would like Luxembourg to be my double taxation agreement. You, yeah. you, you can't, it, it's got to be, it'll be your new country of residency, which is why I think so many South Africans are opting to go to the traditional havens, like, to move to places like Mauritius or Dubai, because uh, obviously they benefit because of their, their new residency. So most countries, just, it's not it's not in all situations, it's certainly not all countries, but most, most international currency countries at least apply a residency-based tax system. So it would be the country that you're resident in. Yeah. Um, regarding CGT exit tax, does this apply to your cash balances in your account? No, there's no um, uh, capital gain on cash balances. Okay, I'll, I'll take that one. What happens if I already have an investor account? <laughs> can, I don't want to say this in the public forum, but <laughs> can uh, like this, uh, can I like this to you guys? Can I link, I'm assuming, can I link this to you guys as well? Uh, so yes, you can. So, okay, if you've got, okay, so it depends on the type of investor account that you have set up. So if you have an investor account set up with another treasury agent, so basically it's called a CCM account, a corporate cash manager, um, we can do the transaction and book it into that underlying investor account. It does get a little bit more complex when you're with Investec Private Bank. Um, I don't know if I'm going to say this in a public forum, but Investec Private Bank can be a little bit expensive. 
Uh, Andrew, maybe just <laughs> give me give me a check, give me a call afterwards, and I'll tell you the true story. But uh, it it is it is a, if you're running through their CCM accounts, those are those are accounts that where uh, essentially the the financial advisor that's running the accounts or the financial the the financial services provider that has the relationship that is running the CCM accounts, they control the costs on the account. So it depends on what your provider is passing on in terms of the institutional rates that they're getting. Like I said, we we run it at incredibly aggressive rates. So um, we essentially, you know, part of the whole philosophy behind RandSwiss is that, you know, the more clients that we get together, the more people that we club together, the more scale that we generate, um, the more costs we can pass on to you because we're buying in more and more bulk. And, and we generally try to be as competitive on cost as we possibly can. So uh, I can't guarantee the cost that you will pay on, on a non-RAND Swiss investing account, if you want to put it that way. But on, you know, at the same time, setting up with, with a RAND Swiss investing account, like I said, we, we uh, like last Friday, we, we had a structure closing. It was a third party structure that we we're assisting with custody with. Uh, and the client literally had currency in South Africa. He made the decision on, I think, Thursday night that he needed the, the money in the account to strike on Monday. Uh, we literally had a we had an investor bank account open for him in, in it was under an hour we had the money he instant payment paid the money in we had the settlement done on the same day um so it's, it's super like it's super super simple for us to open those bank accounts so i would uh, i would encourage you rather to use rand swiss but if it is another ccm platform uh, we can link the trades into those accounts um, we should be able to take over the history if you just want to move the account to us. But if you're with a private bank, then it's a whole different, a whole different kettle of fish. And we'll have to have a look at that on a case by case basis. Okay. Um, the Fed is so confused. So are other central banks? Okay. Yeah. Well, that's that. Well, like, uh, if you've watched our if you watch Virg's little podcast that he does every week, uh, you, I think he's he's very convinced that the Fed uh, the Fed is going to blink now. But yeah, that's probably not really a question, but a, a comment and maybe a valid one. I think Virg would take a call further. Okay. okay. What are what are the tax implications on the global portfolio fund? Okay. So the, the global managed portfolio, the tax implications. It depends how we structure the uh, the the portfolio for you. So we are very concerned with the underlying securities broken and the fund manager. My job is to try and get you returns as best I can, pick the best quality companies. Um, you would speak to Yaku as a financial advisor to set up the, the structuring of that. So mm -hmm. if if it's a if it's a you know let's say a small portfolio which I, I consider like an entry level portfolio at about fifty thousand rand or fifty thousand dollars at least, um, then the, the tax implications I probably would say if this you know it comes down to your personal situation. They would say, leave it in a direct name. So you do it in your direct name. You're below the CITES uh, level, which is uh, $60,000 in the US, uh, 325,000 pounds in the UK. Um, and I mean, we've got, everyone's got their own view on, on what the CITES implications are. And I think that's a whole nother webinar in itself, but you're below that threshold anyway. Remember you've got a 40, it's 40,000 Rand capital gains exemption every year. So what happens is I generally try and reset for clients. You know, we trim and we balance and we, we make sure that we release a little bit of, uh, a little bit of capital gain into the portfolio every year. Um, in that way, uh, most clients will be able to you know, take advantage of that, that 40,000 Rand capital gains exemption if you're a direct client. Obviously, if it's a much larger portfolio, you know, if we're talking 30, 40 million rands uh, value that you want to allocate to that, we generally have got plenty of trusts that are structured into the portfolio. Uh, the client either has an international trust. Uh, you can even do it in a local trust, or then, although we then have to do an asset swap. Uh, but generally, we find uh, a lot of trusts out of Mauritius, Guernsey, Channel Island trusts. Um, are, are set up for clients. Either they've already got the trust structure in place and we're just opening the portfolio in the name of the trust. Obviously, then they're facing the, uh, the tax regime of whichever jurisdiction they have their trust in. Uh, if you don't have a trust or you're not sure if you should have an international trust, uh, we've got Yaku here. He's the kind of guy that'll sit, do your full needs analysis and say, hey, you want the global managed portfolio in the trust, but there's all these other benefits to it as well. And then depending on the jurisdiction we choose, um, we can we can we can assist you with that. And like I said, we've got great guys in Mauritius fiduciary companies that will assist you with the trust setup if that's the, the right thing. There, I mean, you know, what, I don't know what your limit is on the trust at the moment, but it's probably at least 30 million. Uh, that you'd be needing to put into the trust to make the actual trust administration fees worth it, that the tax is going to more than offset it. But it's not always the case because sometimes if you have a very long um, runway on, on how long they're, you know, we were setting up for two young guys that have inherited a lot of money. 
Uh, and they've got that trust is going to be active for them for, for the next 20, 30, 40 years. The tax benefit of that trust is just going to far outweigh um, any any uh, kind of setup fees on the trust. So that's that's again, it's a, it's a discussion you should be having with your board, your, your, your wealth manager. Um, the other way of kind of structuring it for tax is we can put these portfolios inside the traditional uh, insurance wrappers as well. So we, we're set up on both Momentum uh, with, with Momentum uh, International Endowment Option and we're set up on the, with the Sunland Global Life Plan. Both of those, uh, so they, they almost act as like mini trusts, if you want to put it that way, uh, far lower entry criteria. They move the situs and they sort out some of the estate planning concerns um, for, for clients uh, in that way. Uh, they do add a little bit of fees. So again, it, it's not a no brainer, but then you obviously face the endowment, uh, the endowment tax regime. So your, your CGT drops to only 12% uh, at, at maximum. Uh, and uh, I think there's no, the portfolio doesn't generate income uh, and the dividends are, of course, after DWT. So, um, yeah. so the endowment wrapper, maybe just to add to that, is if you're a high net worth individual, that, that you know, if it's a large amount of money that you want to put into this, uh, from a CGT perspective, then an endowment makes a lot of sense because of the 30%, 40% inclusion rate of the 30 is 12% out of Gary expense. So, um, it, it, sorry, Irene, it's not a, uh, it's, it's not a short answer, but sure. I, in essence, it's CGT. And then depending on your situation, hmm. everybody's going to look a little bit different into what is the true tax implication true. because yeah. everybody is placed via different vehicles or different structures hmm. uh, to, to be the most but, beneficial. But, but, but for I, them. I think the easiest way of answering it is that generally we generate CGT inside that. So, so we do have short-term positions. I mean, I always give the example where we, we saw there was a deal uh, basically that Monsanto was being bought out. Monsanto was trading about $100. The, the buyout price was at 128 We looked at the deal and said, there's no way this is going to fall apart. Um, the deal should close in the next three to six months and we can get 28% return on that. That was probably our shortest position that we've had in the portfolio. But generally, because it's a, it's, a, it's a managed portfolio, because we are managing it for you and the intention is long term, uh, we, we've never had a client that, has, that SARS has approached and said, oh, this is a trading portfolio, you have to pay income tax on it. All, all the gains on the portfolio would be CGT. But of course, as we said, trusts, wrappers, um, uh, you know, there's many ways of, of, of changing the, 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 the tax profile to make it more attractive to you. But again, if you're retired and you don't have much income coming in, um, you know, you're, you're, as Jackie says, the 40% inclusion rate, if, if, you're, if you're only in a, an 18% income tax bracket plus the 40% inclusion, you know, like you can get the tax down to almost nothing, but it, it really depends on, on who you are as a person. So mm -hmm. quite a difficult answer, but hopefully that gave you a bit of flavor about the cool things that you can do uh, to mitigate the impact of your, your investment taxes. Um, okay, great, Alex, thank you. Um, Gary, is CG, not this Gary, uh, is CGT exit tax payable on SA fixed property? Mm -hmm. Exit tax, no. Okay, so uh, Gary, just think back to, to, to one of the points I made is an SA non-tax resident. So, so you're not a, a tax resident in South Africa anymore. You're only uh, a tax on your SA-based assets. If you're still a tax resident in South Africa, global, worldwide assets. But once you've immigrated and uh, you've, you've formalized that, now you're a non-tax resident. So you will only be taxed on SA assets. So no, there won't be an exit tax applicable. It will be normal CGT on the day that you sell it. But you would sell it to your international, just so that I understand it, you would sell it to your international self. And that, so, so you would have a CGT event on the local property, but it would reset your CGT on that property at that level. And then going forward, if you sold it in future, that CGT would become applicable from the, the time that you immigrated to the time you ultimately sell the property because that property sits in the SA regime. So because it's an SA based asset, sure, yeah. they, there's no CGT event payable on immigration. Oh, okay. 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 So, yeah. so yeah. It, it's still a SA based asset. Remember, SARS just wants the piece of the pie, right? So, so you don't, okay. as so, long okay, as they get, you, okay, so it doesn't reset. Okay, yeah. No, as cool. long as they get the, the slice of the pie, an SA based asset will is, is a good example of them uh, staying, uh, getting that once you sell it. Okay. 
Great, guys. I think that takes us to the end of the questions. We've been on the call for an you know, hour and a half, which is normally how long it takes with Q&A. Uh, but thank you very much for listening. Uh, if you do have more questions, uh, you can just pop them through to us at uh, info at ranswiss.com. Uh, or, uh, I mean, many of you have our private email addresses as well. If you're already clients, uh, feel free just to shoot us an email and we'll answer and, and flesh it out as we can. Uh, as I said, if you are kind of thinking about immigrating, uh, really worth uh, kind of maybe setting up a, an appointment and, uh, and coming to just chat through your personal situation. Because as you can see, so many of these things, we can give you kind of the broad guidelines, but so many of these have to do with the, the personal, the nuances of your personal situation. So really worth uh, shoot through to the JSC uh, if you can. Otherwise, we can jump on Zoom or Teams if you're not in uh, Johannesburg. Uh, and we're always happy to sit with clients, kind of understand the situation and see how we can uh, best serve you. So thank you everyone for the, the time um, and uh, yeah, catch us on the next webinar.